Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation for uh, North Brazilian Neurosurgery Congress. Uh, it's a very convenient tool. Uh, uh, it's, it's very good because uh, everybody uh, do, not, do not go to the place <laughs> with a wrong flight. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good for everybody. Uh, anyway, uh, today uh, I'd like to share my uh, neurosurgery experience, especially about the uh, uh, microsurgical uh, cerebral vascular surgery and uh, uh, skull base. And uh, uh, later, uh, I will show you, show you my uh, uh, experience of uh, acute, revascular, acute revascularization surgically uh, for acute stroke. Um, I always say the same thing. What is necessary for accurate surgery? Uh, to see the object in the operative field, this is the most important thing in, in surgery to confirm the anatomy, to confirm the, the situation of the lesion. So to do this, the, of course, the complete hemostasis is necessary and uh, we need an appropriate approach to expose the lesion. This is an example of a complete hemostasis. Uh, I, show, uh, I, I, I show this video uh, every time. This is a, a left side front temporal craniotomy for unruptured aneurysm uh, after skin elevation and a temporal muscle retracted posteriorly from the temporine. And uh, uh, now the remaining spinal ridge is taken out and the orbital scrutinization are uh, uh, conducted. And uh, uh, the dirt surface of the bone is covered by surgical and the complete hemostasis of the epidural space before opening dura. I, uh, I always force my young guys to get a complete hemostasis like this before opening dura. I hate red cell. This is an important procedure. Uh, this is another example uh, of the skull base approach. This is the left side uh, combined petrosal anterior and the posterior petrosectomy. At first, I do a mastodectomy uh, for uh, post posterior petrosectomy. Now, the uh, mass of the bone is uh, during away. And uh, now, uh, here is a sinodural angle. The temporal tegument is uh, skeletonized, the sigmoid sinus and the pretty sigmoid dura is uh, skeletonized. And in the depth, there is a semicircular nose, lateral posterior superior, and the partially uh, end of lymphatic sac is exposed. At this, at, at this moment, the craniotomy is added, and uh, this is a subtemporal approach to a middle fossa. Uh, this is a from an ovary and the GSPN is a dissected. Uh, you can see the, the venous oozing from the cavernous sinus. Uh, this uh, breathing must be completely stopped. And uh, this is a uh, during of the temporal rhomboid. Uh, I am Skeletonizing C6 internal carotid just below GSPN, uh, skeletonizing internal auditory canal, preserving a cochlear to the semicircular canal, and uh, preserving, of course, the C6 internal carotid artery. The important thing uh, we need a complete hemostasis to see the anatomy. Without, a, without complete hemostasis, you can't see anything. And uh, everybody knows the 
temporal occlusion time of a microanosmosis always disturbed, always prolonged by uh, the incomplete hemostasis. If the breathing coming into a subdural space from epidural, it always prolongs the temporal occlusion time. So the hemostasis always I emphasize hemostasis and uh, we have to know the way of the hemostasis, appropriate way of hemostasis, which is appropriate. Coagulation is bipolar or uh, monopolar coagulation or put the surgical cell gel form covering the breathing point or using a fibrin soaked gel form or surgery cell. We have to know, or uh, direct stitching of the breathing point. We have to know the exact way. And the uh, most fundamental approach in neurosurgery is cerebrian dissection, so-called transcribian approach. This is an example of a transcribian approach. Uh, this is a small left PCOM unruptured aneurysm. You can see it. The, the PCOM is arising from the media neck of the aneurysm. This is the left side front temporal craniotomy. And in between uh, multiple superficial cerebrium vein, uh, I am beginning the arachnoid incising. And now I am trying to come into a uh, insular system by uh, separating the uh, uh, superficial cerebrum vein and uh, uh, small MCA arteries coming up to a uh, temporal surface. Here, the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe is adherent with uh, uh, tiny arachnoid trabeculates. We can cut only uh, arachnoid trabeculate other structures cannot be cut, cannot be sacrificed. With the highest magnification, even tiny veins can be seen, can be confirmed. And gradually we can approach to the target lesion. Here is the aneurysm and the ocular motor nerve and the temporal uncus. Aneurysm is adherent to a temporal uncus. And uh, uh, I am trying to put a temporary clip on the spur crying with carotid and uh, uh, dissect with the annual neck and I put the clip. With the highest magnification, uh, I am adjusting the, the clip placement not to bite the anterior term perforating artery arising uh, uh, from a proxima uh, media to the aneurysm. The uh, IC green shows the good frequency of the PCOM and the corridor arteries and the anterior perforation arteries. So this is an example of a transcribent approach. So, uh, broader dissection in cerebral tissue, you can cut only arachnoid membrane and the trabeculus you can sacrifice any vasculature, preserve all vessels, not only arteries, but also veins. Highest orientation to visualize tiny structures in the fissure. You need the appropriate attention to the dissecting point with the spatula and or suction. This is an example of a dual closure. I uh, always use a microscope after the uh, approach and uh, uh, manipulation of any of them or bypass. Uh, after finishing the mi microsurgical approach, manipulation, subdural manipulation, continuously I use a microscope to close the bureau with a uh, uh, 5 0 chlorine. Uh, I force my young guy to do this. Exactly. This is a, a principal dimension of the dual stitching. 
if the zero thickness is key, the appropriate byte of zero stitching should be twice of thickness. And the interval of stitching should be four times of wall thickness. This is the principle to achieve the uh, uh, watertight dura closure. And of course, the dura must be penetrated completely whole layer like this. Two times of the wall thickness, the bite should be two times of wall thickness. So totally the, the distance, the penetration point to another penetration point should be four times of wall thickness. When we stitch the dura or uh, dura, uh, you can hold the dura with uh, forceps like this, then you can penetrate it. This is a very important uh, principle to do a, a complete uh, penetration of a whole layer of dura. Same thing. Uh, can be said in uh, micro-anastomosis. This is a uh, uh, everything technique of a donor and recipient vessel wall. The intima must be faced each other. Then you can penetrate uh, the both uh, vessel wall easily. This is a everything technique. Another important principle is a fish mouth trimming. At the end of a donor, uh, I always cut the donor wall 60 degree oblique cut like this, and uh, uh, same length cutting up. This length uh, can be calculated like this, two times of a shrunk diameter divided by root three. So this length is uh, four times uh, of a shrunk diameter divided root three. This means that uh, almost uh, approximately 2.3 times of a shrunk diameter. Again, the everything. This is the principle of a microsurgical uh, microanastomosis. So stitching bite should be twice of a wall thickness of a vessel wall and the stitching uh, interval should be four times of wall thickness. This is a principle. Uh, this is an example drawing uh, by my colleague Cosmo Noda. Uh, this is a very uh, beautiful illustration. Uh, this is a final view of anastomosis. After stay suture, uh, the intermediate state suture in the middle of the uh, uh, arteriotomy, it uh, helps to stitch the vessel wall easily with the fish mouth trimming. And uh, this is uh, the stitching order uh, recently I am doing. After state suture at heel and toe, uh, first stitch I do just next to a, a heel size stay suture. Then second stitch at the toe size stay suture. And then in the middle of the arteriotomy, so-called intermediate stay suture, then you can uh, stitch like this, then like this. So in this stitch, <coughs> nine stitches, except stay suture. So totally uh, we can stitch 20 stitches, including stay sutures, 20 stitches. So if you spend one minute for one stitch, you can finish 20 stitches in 20 minutes. This is a principle. So the, we, should, uh, we should have a training uh, of the job training with a synthetic tube or uh, uh, the animals, any, uh, the, anyway. Um, 
we should try to finish the one stitch in one minute under microscope using a highest magnification. Now, uh, I'll show you a example of antitemporal approach. Uh, this is a modified approach of a transcribian approach. You can see this is a left side ICA uh, PCOM aneurysm. Uh, this is a very old video. Uh, it's a video in uh, uh, 90, 98, when I, I was uh, 36, more than 20 years ago. With the highest magnification of a microscope, you can see even tiny vessels, veins, and uh, trabeculates. Even with uh, non-high definition, standard definition videos, clearly we can confirm the, uh, the microstructures. The microscope for neurosurgeon is a very strong weapon because uh, it uh, gives us a very a clear, uh, highly magnified vision to confirm the uh, microanatomy. And uh, it helps to maintain the patient new, new neural function. Now here, the corridor artery and the temporal uncus as a, a adhesion by the anchoring of arachnoid particles. And here, the anterior corridor artery is adherent to the uh, uh, distal neck of aneurysm. And uh, you can see tiny daughter zap just on the uh, medial neck of the aneurysm. With the highest magnification and the appropriate approach with the appropriate direction to the target, we can confirm, we can see everything. And the CT angel immediately after the surgery. And this is an example of a kissing aneurysm. Uh, this is the operation in 2003. Uh, here, PCOM and the corridor artery aneurysm is so strongly adherent. Partially breathing happened, but the complete temporary trapping of the aneurysm uh, works well. So I could separate completely the both aneurysm adhesion. Uh, this is the first clipping to the uh, PCOM aneurysm. The corridor aneurysm is bigger and uh, still unruptured. So once uh, I could uh, defraud the ICA, then after recovery of the patient, again, I can put the temporary clip to trap the aneurysm. The problem is like this, very strong adhesion of the uh, anterior corridor artery this small anterior corridor artery branch is the most important branch of uh, anterior corridor artery because this is the feeding internal capsule. Big trunk of anterior corridor artery is feeding corridor plexus, not anterior uh, internal capsule. Small branch always feeding internal capsule, especially arising from a very proximal of the anterior corridor artery the small branch is feeding internal capsule. So preserving a small branch of internal uh, anterocorridor artery is the uh, most important. Even with a uh, very exact manipulation, very small uh, high signal uh, was appeared uh, in uh, uh, the gene of internal capsule. Fortunately, nothing happened in this patient. But with a manipulation like that, 
uh, attention to the, uh, the small rental ventral cord artery, which may feed in the internal capsule, has a ischemic complication, uh, asymptomatic ischemic complication. Anyway, uh, to see the object, to see the uh, tiny object with the highest magnification of microscopy is very important. This is an example of the under temporal approach for basal SC aneurysm, the relatively high position aneurysm, 7.5 millimeter from the crinal line to the uh, aneurysm neck. This is a zygomectomy transzygomatic approach without OZ. The complete hemostasis again and uh, approach to a uh, uh, beidra with the anterotemporal approach. So you can see the stretching of the sphenoparietal sinus, it was released to retract the temporal uncus. And uh, here, the supercerebral artery and the aneurysm and the tiny arteries behind the aneurysm. Uh, I am putting temporary grip on the digital trunk and uh, uh, super, uh, put, uh, right, hips rather PCA. And uh, confirming the uh, distal neck and the uh, proximal neck and uh, small arteries behind the aneurysm. Now, all the branches is uh, detached from the neck and uh, I am confirming whether the small branch behind the aneurysm is preserved or not. Everything could be preserved. MRI scan and the CT angel shows a good exclusion of the aneurysm. This is the next example is epidural. Epidural antitemporal approach. Sometimes epidural antitemporal approach is uh, necessary because uh, because of the uh, the draining pattern of the superficial cerebral veins. In this case, this is a small left side PCOM aneurysm. You can see uh, in a perioperative CT angio and uh, after craniotomy, you can see the the very big dural sinus on the temporal side. It's uh, sharing the uh, venous draining with the superficial cerebral vein. In this case, the subdural trans approach is uh, uh, impossible with preserving all the cerebral uh, venous drainage. So I decided to perform the epidural onto temporal approach by incising the uh, meningeal optal band super optal fissure here. After skeletonizing orbit, exposing the, uh, the meaning of the band and the uh, of the fissure, dura appropriate is incised carefully, sharply with a 15 knife. And the uh, anterolateral triangle is partially open. I am getting a hemostasis with a suggestive and a five minutes of the gel form. And uh, that is the foramen rotundum. The B2 is still covered with the dura propria. Now I am incising dura propria on uh, B2 of trigeminal nerve here. Now the B2 is uh, gradually is, uh, exposing. Now you can see the B1 and the B2, between the B1 and the B2, there is an anterolateral triangle. And the partially the Lateral loop is open and the venous breathing from the lateral loop is coming. It, it can be stopped with the surgery cell. And uh, you can see in the middle of the operative field, the force nerve can be confirmed here, like this. This is a very important anatomy. Uh, here, here is the anticlinal process, super-optal fissure. Third nerve is running, the fourth nerve is running here, 
V1 and the V2. Here is the lateral triangle, partially open the lateral loop for lateral triangle. This is a confirmation of the uh, lateral cavernous sign as well. Uh, at this moment, uh, the frontal dura can be inside linearly to the, uh, the apex of an anticlinal process. And uh, the dural incision can be extended to the uh, oculomotor frame with a uh, uh, high magnification we can confirm the frown and ochromotorius could be opened sharply. And uh, I am confirming the uh, uh, personal learning course. And that is, uh, uh, I'm confirming the, the circular foramen as well. <laughs> this is a proximal cerebrum dissection to secure the, uh, the retrocarti prion. Here is the cisternal ocular motor segment. The arachnoid trabecula posterior to ocular motor nerve uh, should be incised because uh, by retraction of a temporal uncus, the trabecular between the uncus and the ocular motor through the ocular motor nerve posteriorly laterally, and uh, it causes uh, also operative ocular motor nerve So the incising freeing ocular motor by the anchoring of uh, tiny trabecular is very important. And now, the uh, ICA and the P2P1 segment, ocular motor and aneurysm and uh, uh, PCOM. Aneurysm is attaching to the post-cryonic process. Uh, we can uh, confirm it and uh, sharply, directly uh, detach the aneurysm. The delicate membrane behind the aneurysm, media to an uh, ocular motor, can be inside and you can export the visual account. Now, the parent artery condition is not bad. So you can put the temperature on the spread kind of the carotid. And uh, uh, put the tentative neck clipping on the aneurysm in order to preserve the uh, anterior term perforating artery arising from the proximal pecum. Then temperature could be taken out. This is a, a actual procedure of uh, epidural anterior temporal approach. Uh, next case is uh, uh, thyroid hemorrhage with a temporal hematoma. A relatively large uh, lactate aneurysm right side. This is a no part video of uh, acute surgery. Now the preparation is uh, finished and the uh, skin incision is begun. Uh, in uh, 10, 15, 10, 12 minutes, the dura is open, and here is uh, the orifice of the uh, temporal hematoma. So this is a decompression by a partial removal of the hematoma, not to injure the breathing point of the ruptured angel because the hematoma is connecting to the rupture point. Now, temporal creep on the sprocrinoid and the C1 segment of a carotid. Uh, tentative uh, trapping of the aneurysm, then uh, you can put the clip on the neck by with uh, reducing the aneurysm tension because the aneurysm is very big. Without the reducing tension of the aneurysm, it causes a neck laceration. So the, the reducing the tension of the aneurysm is very important. And uh, this is the ocular motor adherent to the aneurysm. 
that the, here is a posterior to the ultramotor, here is the injured part of the temporal lentus by the, the rapture of the aneurysm. Now, the completely aneurysm is detached from the ultramotor nerve and uh, uh, confirm the, uh, the old anatomy, uh, preserve the PCOM and the anterior perforating artery. I see green shows well. And this is a post operative CT scan and the 3D CT angle. Complete neck lifting, no neck, neck remnant, uh, especially a medial part of the uh, We have published of the uh, uh, complete clot removal by meticulous irrigation and the continuous uh, low dose uh, administration of nephalobitin, intravenous nephalobitin to prevent the symptomatic coronavirus spasm on a world of neurosurgery. So, bloodless dissection in cerebral tissue is very important. Uh, you can cut only arachnoid membrane and the trabeculates, preserve all vessels, not only arteries, but veins, highest magnification to visualize tiny structures in the tissue, appropriation, uh, to the dissecting point with spatula and or suction. And the meticulous rinsing and the irrigating subarachnoid clots in dissected fissures to prevent direct virus spasm. Uh, the time is limited, so uh, I skip the uh, anterior interhemisphere approach. Uh, Next, uh, we can discuss the, the therapeutic carotid occlusion with uh, hypo bypass. This is uh, uh, several uh, representative cases of uh, hypo bypass for therapeutic carotid occlusion in order to exclude the uh, uh, complex large giant carotid aneurysms. The high bypass using a radial artery or saphenous vein between the external carotid and the M2 segment of a middle cerebral artery is very uh, effective and simple, uh, very good uh, procedure to treat uh, such a complex lesion. Uh, until 2018, uh, I have uh, 117 cases uh, for almost uh, 20 years. The draft patency was uh, uh, 96%. Uh, the post-operative recognition of annuals uh, was 1.7%, two cases in 117 cases. Uh, all, all of two cases was a, a cavernous segment giant aneurysm with a proximal ligation. Uh, I had no post-operative rapture after surgery. Uh, outcome, overall outcome uh, was uh, excellent. The modified ranking skill, scale zero to two uh, almost 95, 6%. Jaya, almost same. Lash, 100%. Uh, blood blister like uh, ruptured aneurysm, 67% uh, was modified ranking scale zero. But uh, uh, remaining 33% ranking three. But the important thing, with this procedure, we have no mortality. This is an example of a 74-year-old female, previously coiled, complex, thrombos, giant ICPC aneurysm. This is a neck preparation before opening head. Then uh, STA is prepared, from temporal craniotomy is performed, and again, this uh, trans-driven approach to expose the whole M2 segment, M1 segment, 
and uh, aneurysm. This is a preparation for SPM cell bypass on the M3 segment, and the M2 segment is exposed for uh, radial artery anastomosis. Now, the SPA, uh, one of the SPA branch is anastomosed to an M3 segment as an M2 side anastomosis with the fish mouse forming on uh, the uh, SPA. You can see with the highest magnification, you can confirm the uh, exact penetration point of the pen zero. And after finishing one side, confirm inside whether there is a mouse stitching or, or liver stitching of, with the, the other side wall, which is very important. Then uh, the STM is the bypass is finished and the bypass is open. The IC green shows the good patency of the STM cell bypass. And then this is another remaining branch of SPA. It is connected with the, a 22 gauge uh, venura, which is connecting to a, a blood pressure a monitoring. And uh, this is a ready route, the M2 bypass. The Penetration to a SPA uh, is, a, is a for a purpose to monitor the MC pressure after, uh, before and after opening a bypass. Anyway, this is a radial artery M2 anastomosis with a 9 0 suture. With the highest magnification, you can see everything of each vessel wall, donor and the recipient, you can see. It's a very easy condition to penetrate, to penetrate uh, both with the wall and the confirm inside. And uh, this is a uh, uh, next stitch to a uh, uh, toe side. Now, so this is a preparation for a graft placement to the uh, 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 submandibular root. This is a, a chest tube, 22 gauge chest tube. And the radial artery is uh, expanded with heparinite sudden like this. And they put the uh, 724 Yasha Jiro clip uh, to maintain the, the expansion of the graph in order to avoid the twisting of the graph during the uh, placement of the graph in the submandibular corner. After uh, placing the graph, again, graph is expanded to remove the twisting or kinking and uh, uh, external cartilage has an arteriotomy with aorta punch. Uh, this is a 7-0 pronova uh, with a running suture. Then the surgical ICA is cramped. Then the radial artery is open. Now, the uh, blood flow is provided to the brain through the uh, radial artery graph from the uh, external artery to the middle server. And I am confirming choroidal artery is a patent by the uh, high flow bypass. Now, uh, with the uh, ICA occlusion, the anterior choroidal artery could be preserved. So, in this case, just proximal ligation of our internal carotid artery, then no touch to the no touch aneurysm. Patient recovered well without no neurological deficit except uh, persistent ultramotor palsy. This is a example of the uh, MC pressure monitoring through uh, SPMC bypass. 
one of this key branch could be chimerated, which is connecting to a pressure transducer now. By clamping the SP trunk, you can monitor the MC pressure. Like this, MC pressure is uh, uh, 62 millimercury in mean pressure. After IC occlusion, you can see the MC pressure decline 62 to 6, 46, 43. By opening the graft, the MC pressure recovered from 43 to 57. It's a uh, 92% uh, to a control MC pressure. This, this is a real time monitoring of a graph functioning. I see green shows good condition as well. This is an example of a, a MC pressure monitoring through the STA MC bypass by clamping the STA trunk. I'll show you a, a malfunction of a bypass graph under the, uh, the MC pressure monitoring. Here, after high flow bypass, ICA clamp, MC pressure decline. Now, graph is open. MC pressure, 30 millimercury. By opening graph, it's a slight elevated, 42, 43 millimercury. I am feeling the, the pulsation and the pulling up, no pulsation. You can see the 180 degree uh, twisting of the graph. This was a cause of the graph malfunction. The MC pressure monitoring is very sensitive to, uh, to this kind of uh, complication. Now again, uh, graph it twisted. Then press the graph and I re the motion and again MC pressure monitor. The 73 millimercury control pressure declined to 42 and it immediately recovered to a uh, 50, 50, 60 millimercury uh, after opening a high flow bypass. Like this. So, the monitoring whether the, the graph is working well or not is uh, very important during surgery. With this procedure, we have a very good result of the high flow bypass. Uh, in, uh, according, according to our study, uh, we realized that the MCA pressure ratio before and after, uh, before occlusion of uh, internal cautis and uh, uh, after occlusion of internal cautis with open bypass, MCA pressure ratio should be more than 0.8. 80% of, of uh, MCA pressure compared to a control MC pressure is necessary to avoid post-operative hemodynamic ischemia in a therapeutic carotid occlusion with high flow bypass. Uh, we have published it on uh, World Neurosurgery in 2015, you can see it. So uh, during surgery, the MC pressure monitoring is quite important for uh, evaluating the bypass functioning. So important thing is the MC pressure. Uh, and as well, before surgery of the uh, therapeutic internal carotid occlusion, we perform the uh, balloon test occlusion uh, with uh, monitoring, measuring the stamp pressure after the occlusion of of ICA with the balloon. Now during balloon test occlusion, after inflating balloon of ICA and occluded ICA, if the stamp pressure uh, was uh, more than 80% to uh, control uh, ICA pressure, 
basically, there is no indication of revascularization because, uh, as I told you, if the uh, MC pressure after occlusion of ICA, uh, regardless uh, bypass is provided or, 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 or not provided, the more than 80% of MC pressure could be maintained, nothing happened. So uh, in a burn test occlusion, if the stamp pressure was more than 0 0.8, uh, we have no surgical indication of bypass. But uh, in uh, uh, almost cases, the stamp pressure is uh, less than 0 0.8. So, uh, less than 0 0.8, we, we need a something revascularization. So, how can we determine the you know, graft size for therapeutic carotid occlusion? Uh, we, have a, we have a many discussion for a long time. The low flow bypass is, is good for, for therapeutic carotid occlusion or uh, as I emphasize, high flow bypass is necessary for uh, ICA occlusion. We have uh, many long discussions, but uh, simply the, uh, according to a hug and pause law, the, the provided flow by the, the vessel is proportional to the diameter like this. It's uh, the simple proportion, uh, the simple principle. This is a, uh, uh, um, mod, the model of the uh, ICA blood flow. With the ICA patency, the, the provided blood flow by ICA is a, a red part. And the uh, collateral flow through the uh, contralateral ICA through the ACOM and the uh, alcohol flow from vertebral vagina system like this. A control and the left meningeal anastomosis from PCA as well from the uh, vertebral vessel system. So when we perform the barren test occlusion here, we, if we occlude here, we can measure the stamp pressure. The measuring the, the stamp pressure measured by uh, barren test occlusion is showing the collateral power of these uh, collateralis. So after the ICA occlusion and the high flow bypass is made like this, and uh, in almost case, the graft size, regardless radial artery was happiness, graft size is uh, smaller than uh, the ICA diameter. So, The pure provided blood flow by ICA is here, this part. And the remaining, this green part is the blood flow provided collateral flow. This can be de defined uh, as a K, but this part can be defined one minus K like this. After bypass, the graft row like this, but the uh, collateral flow is the same. So the total, total blood flow by uh, after bypass, regardless high flow or STMC bypass, expected flow ratio here and here it can be uh, calculated like this because this part is proportional to a square of the uh, uh, di diameter ratio between uh, uh, graft and ICA. Larger means 
the ICA diameter. Small r means a graph diameter. It's a simple quadratic function. With this formula, we can plot the graph like this. The, this is uh, 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 at, uh, at y axis uh, at x zero. Uh, if the remaining uh, blood flow has a collateral power, if collateral was poor, the depending on the uh, depending on the graph size ratio, the curve like this. And uh, as I told you, MCAP ratio uh, should be more than 0 0.8 to avoid ischemic complication. So we need uh, uh, this part, this part after surgery. So, uh, again, MCAP ratio, if it was uh, uh, less than 0 0.8, patient have the uh, something hemodynamic ischemia in our cities. But uh, with a uh, conservative treatment, patient recovered well. Uh, these cities, these series, which indicate post-operative hemodynamic ischemia, all, all cases uh, has been performed the high flow bypass using radial artery or saphenous. If the MC pressure ratio or CBF was more than 80%, nothing happened. Nothing happened. This is important, 80 percent. So with this formula, we can calculate the uh, example. Uh, with this formula, we can uh, uh, modify the, the, this formula as uh, R, like this. If flow ratio is necessary more than 0 0.8, you can put 0 0.8 to here. Uh, it can be calculated graph size should be more than 0 0.9 to uh, diameter of a spiracrinoid internal carotid. If the spiracrinoid carotid diameter was four millimeter, graph size should be more than 3.6 millimeter. With this formula, we can determine the appropriate graph size, which can uh, obtain the uh, more than 80% of uh, blood flow compared to uh, ICA. Again, this is uh, the graph protein uh, based on this formula. And additionally, uh, this is a, a as well, important thing. If the recipient, which we choose as a recipient for uh, radial artery or saphenous vein graph, if the diameter of the recipient was too small, it becomes a bottleneck. So to avoid the, the bottleneck, this, uh, we need a, uh, appropriate size of a recipient, which it, what size is appropriate? It can be calculated like this. If the peripheral, peripheral the vascular resistance was the same in the proximal and the distal, it can be calculated. The provided blood flow by the graph is divided equally to proximally and to distally. So the, the area of a recipient can be calculated like this. Mm. 
then uh, appropriate size of a recipient should be more than uh, due to 0 0.5. This means that uh, more than 0 0.7. So the recipient size uh, should be more than 0 0.7 to a uh, draft size, right? The, we have published it on a journal of neurosurgery in uh, 2017. Uh, please uh, read it carefully. And uh, this is a very useful to determine the appropriate graft size for therapeutic internal carotid occlusion and uh, uh, confirm the uh, uh, functioning of the graft properly or not during surgery, real timely. Okay, it's a very important. So, uh, squ uh, square stitch of a micro micro suture, micro anastomosis is important. Square stitch means that uh, bite of length should be two times the wall thickness. Interval of stitch should be four times of wall thickness. Fish streaming is a principle of the cut with 60 degree at the donor end and the same length cutting up. Everything, intima to intima, Arteriotomy length of side to side anastomosis. Uh, I, I, didn't I, I couldn't mention the side to side, but uh, uh, arteriotomy, ar arteriotomy length in the side to side anastomosis, it should be more than three times of the diameter. And uh, in uh, side to side anastomosis, bottom side always inverting, not averting. This means that uh, in a side to side anastomosis, the collagen fiber of the cutting edge of the wall is exposing inside the volumen. So it may cause the acute thrombosis. To avoid the occlusion of side to side anastomosis, we need a big orifice. To obtain the big orifice in the side to side anastomosis, we need at least uh, three times of things. Of a diameter of the parent artery. And uh, in uh, therapeutic carotid occlusion, uh, we can measure the MC pressure ratio. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, equivalent with the flow ratio. It can be calculated with this formula uh, 1 minus K uh, times uh, the square of a diameter ratio plus. K. K means uh, the remaining collateral uh, flow. Uh, diameter of the recipient should be 0 0.7 times of a donor vessel. This is a, a principle to perform the uh, uh, microanastomosis. I can go to uh, uh, next talk about the uh, acute uh, revascularization. Sorry, acute revascularization. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see? Yes. Okay. So uh, we can dis discuss after uh, after this talk uh, everything. Uh, nowadays. Uh, many of you has uh, experience of uh, uh, acute recanalization of acute stroke uh, with endovascular therapy. I have nothing to. Uh, I, I, I have a. I have a disclosure of the uh, uh, Takayama, Takayama instruments. Uh, I have a patent fee. Uh, 
Um, anyway, I have I have been performing the uh, surgical embrectomy, surgical revascularization for acute stroke uh, in this uh, more than twenty years. Uh, nowadays, uh, endovascular thrombectomy became a standard procedure after 2015 Nashville Hope. But uh, now uh, in our hospital, uh, we are trying to do a surgical embryectomy as well after the failure of the endovascular recognition as a third procedure. Uh, this is uh, my colleague in my hospital. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, they, are, they are all neurosurgeons and uh, these uh, three guys are all endovascular surgeon, uh, all endovascular surgeon uh, who they, are, uh, they have a training of a surgery under me uh, in this uh, three, five years. Uh, all young guys. Uh, so, or uh, uh, 30s, 30s, 40s. Hmm. Uh, in Japan, the uh, acute, even acute stroke, the uh, at first, uh, as a first contact, neurosurgeon treats them. So we, we are uh, cooperating each other to treat uh, such a patient. Uh, the target region is a uh, carotid. Uh, MCA and uh, uh, rarely visual trunk or PCA. Uh, this is an example of the uh, of the MCA occlusion like this. Immediately, we can start the, the study diffusion weighted image MRA and T2 star. Uh, we can finish it in 15 minutes with MRI scan. Uh, after MRI, immediately we perform the 4D CT angiogram uh, with a 320 row CT scanner. Uh, simultaneously, we check the orthography like this in order to check the uh, 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 aorta dissection. Many of patients have, uh, so sometimes occasionally patients have the aortic dissection and as well, uh, without our aortic dissection, patients have the very scler sclerotic tortuous aorta. And uh, the problem is the ischemic complication of the uh, 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 intestinal colon with uh, a very hard atherosclerotic change of a super mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery. And as well, we can confirm whether the renal artery has a, a good enough uh, size or not. This means that uh, post-operatively, uh, patient have the something renal area with a low flow of a renal artery. Some, sometimes, uh, often happen the anuria after surgery. So, we always check the autography and uh, uh, intracranial. By a diffuse, diffuse three study, after six hours from onset until 16 hours, even, even after six hours uh, until 16 hours, the endovascular recognition had an advantage in uh, uh, prognosis. So, uh, after diffuse three, we prolong the uh, the golden time to uh, 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 sixteen hours. Uh, but uh, after that, we had a dawn trial. In a dawn trial, after sixteen hours to twenty four hours, still endovascular recognition uh, has a very good result. So we now. Uh, our golden time to treat the acute thrombosis is uh, prolonged until 24 hours. Very important. 
like this. The thrombectomy prognosis was quite uh, significantly good uh, compared to uh, uh, medical treatment. So, uh, the treatment for acute lip perfusion in a hospital is like this. If patient come within 4.5 hours, at first we, uh, we try to do a intravenous TPA and simultaneously patient transfer to an angio suite. And uh, we try to do angiography and uh, still the artery was occluded. We try to do endovascular thrombectomy immediately. If patient come after 4.5 hours, and uh, now uh, until 24 hours, we do the endovascular thrombectomy uh, directly without TPA. After procedure on the, of endovascular thrombectomy, if still uh, recanalization could not be achieved, if uh, patient condition was, uh, was tolerant, we try to do open craniotomy, embolectomy. This is an indication in our institute for uh, acute stroke. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, same with other big studies. In this eight years, after I, uh, I, I moved to Sapporo, uh, we had uh, 118 cases. Surgically, 38%, and vascular, 62%. After Nashville Hope, here, Nashville Hope. Uh, until Nashville Hope, we did open craniotomy and a surgical embryotomy. But after Nashville Hope, we switched to uh, endovascular first. Last year, eh, all, all cases were treated eh, with endovascular. Uh, these are uh, clinical character characteristics between the surgery and the endovascular, almost same. Uh, this is a location of uh, occlusion, almost ICA and MCA. Surgery and endovascular, almost same. Uh, this is an example of the uh, uh, left ICA occlusion. Diffusion image shows a very slight high signal in uh, instracortex and basal lungs. You can see. The susceptibility vessel sign of a carotid and M1. You can see this is a, a exposure of a MCA and the carotid. You can see the spiracranial carotid and the IC bifurcation, the M1 is occluded very, with a very big thrombus. Now I am putting out the thrombus and the assistant put the temporary grip on the uh, proximal to the incision. And I am putting out the thrombus from the A1 and the, the cross flow through the A com is coming. And the still the thrombus remain in the M1 segment. It can be pulled out. And the M1 is occluded. At this moment, temporal grip on the carotid is replaced. Distal to a corridor artery, then now corridor artery is reflowed. And uh, the incision is uh, stitched with uh, uh, four stitches. And the uh, IC green shows good frequency of a corridor and the A1, M1. The diffusion shows uh, no exp uh, extending of the uh, uh, high signal area. The patient recovered well. Another case, 75 year old man, uh, cardiogenic basal artery occlusion. You can see the basal artery occluded on MRA. At uh, this moment, patient is comatose and the CT angel shows a, a delayed feeling of a right ICA because uh, this patient have the right common carotid occlusion uh, with a, a collateral flow through the uh, orbital flow from the basal artery to the uh, right uh, ICA. So, 
to save the patient, the organization of the data is necessary. É um que tem tem um barrigão. A gente encontrou lá algumas vezes em a gente encontrou em gravatar em do Lions, é? Tá lembrando mais ou menos? Hmm? Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, 20 minutes from a skin incision, uh, you can approach to a basal bifurcation. Here is the origin of a P1. After temporary clip on your basal trunk. And I am putting out the, the thrombus in the ips lateral P1 and the basal bifurcation. You can see it and uh, push out the thrombus in the uh, basal trunk. I am massaging uh, the basal trunk. Then the blood is coming out through the uh, contralateral SCA. And uh, operate it. Now, uh, three, four stitches to occlude the incision. Now it's a 45 minute from a skin incision. Then you can take out the temporary grip on a bilateral PCA and visit them. It's a 49 minutes from a skin incision complete the flow of the basal trunk and the bilateral PCA. I see green shows a good uh, feeling of a PCA and a good feeling to a right ICA. This is a final view and the uh, post operative CT angel shows a good feeling of a visual trunk and the right ICC character. The uh, CBF is good. Uh, patient recovered well. This is an example of the uh, STMC bypass uh, after failure of the thrombectomy uh, because here, this is a right M1 occlusion, M1 distal occlusion, and the M2 occlusion. The thrombus inside of MC could be taken out. But the problem is, patient has a very strong arteriosclerotic change. And uh, after taking out the thrombus like this, because of a uh, uh, chronic injury of a uh, intima and additional acute uh, injury of intima. Even the, the blood flow coming like this, the blood flow is good like this and confirming the the good blood flow. And uh, after stitching it, this is a super trunk of M2. Super trunk of M2 can be reflow like this. And the remaining inferior trunk of M2 can be stitched and open. But uh, confirming the doprasan, Doprofan was poor. So, in this case, I decided STMC bypass, hard testing uh, SPA, and uh, this is uh, uh, one of the SPA branch. Uh, it is an response to the uh, inferior trunk of M2. Like this. And uh, another branch is an uh, small to a super trunk. In this case, 
the both branches of M2 is uh, saved by a double barrel bypass. You can see the high signal in the basal ganglia uh, appeared, but the patient recovered well. This is a four year later MRA. The SKA uh, grew up bigger and the uh, uh, ICA is uh, feeding the PCA and the uh, uh, A1. This is a result of a process time, overall process time of 118 cases. Patient come within one hour from onset. Uh, door to puncture or door to skin incident for uh, surgery is uh, uh, 53 minutes. And uh, from uh, puncture to uh, deep perfusion or skin incision to deep perfusion was 50 minutes on average. In the end of vascular, the patient come uh, with a one hour and the door to puncture was 67 minutes. We should shorten this time more, uh, less than 60 minutes. And uh, from puncture to reef perfusion was within one hour. Surgery. Uh, we need uh, more time to prepare so it's uh, 84 minutes from door to skin incision. And uh, from skin incision to reperfusion was 41 minutes. It's uh, 40 minutes. It is uh, faster than the endovascular. But uh, totally, uh, this time is two hours in the surgery and the endovascular as well, two hours. Oh, similar. The uh, modified ranking scale at uh, three months, overall like this, now 48.2% modified ranking zero to two. And the is a bit worse than uh, overall result, uh, 45%. Surgery is relatively good, 54%. It is similar with other big studies. Tiki score, overall 75%. Endovascular, 71. Uh, we had uh, one case of access impossible. Open surgery was 84%. Uh, complication, uh, we had 6% uh, of a hemorrhage and 5.5% uh, of uh, death. End vascular, 7% of a hemorrhage, 5% of a death. Surgeon, 4.4% of a hemorrhage, as well, death. I'll show you an example of a rescue of a complication. This is a 69-year-old male, left M1 occlusion. This is a trying of a, a endovascular recognition. Now, the M1, this are embryos embry embry could be taken out. And the M2 still uh, occluded. So my endovascular colleague tried to Recognized, but uh, perforated. So immediately we transfer the patient to oral and uh, open head because the breathing is continued. It's a 30 minutes from a skin incision. Uh, immediately I am trying separating this cerebral feature to expose the breathing point here. You can see. Now it's a breathing point. Put the temporary clip to control the breathing. And extend the, the dissection of the cerebral tissue. Now, fully expose the M2 segment and uh, M3 bifurcation. And I am stitching the the perforation point. There it is. Mm 
then you can leave flow, the blood flow. The IC green shows good patency of the uh, uh, right side bones, but uh, still uh, occluded the inferior branch with the thrombus. The surgical thrombectomy can be done like this, even after failure of uh, endovascular decanalization or uh, with uh, something population complication. This is uh, uh, the, the decanalization time was 54 minutes from a skin incision. The diffusion of the CT scan shows uh, uh, no change before surgery and uh, through decanalization and the patient recovered. So, uh, in our institute, the treatment flow for acute stroke is like this. At the first line, within 4.5 hours from onset, we can use the tissue plus minogen activator. If more than 4.5 hours until 24 hours, directly we choose endovascular from the clinic. After TPA, uh, immediately transfer the patient to angio suite to confirm the uh, recanalization in uh, angio after the failure of endovascular thrombectomy within 16 minutes, uh, we uh, decide the, we should, whether we should perform the open surgical endovascular or not. Or if something complication, hemorrhagic complication happened during endovascular treatment, we choose uh, open surgical uh, hemostasis or embryo. So in conclusion, the overall good outcome was 50, uh, uh, 45%, uh, 48%. No significant difference between endovascular and surgical recanalization. Acute recanalization was effective and uh, the neurological prognosis was good with a short process time, regardless endovascular or surgical. Open embryotomy or emergent STMC bypass can be your third line after the failure of endovascular recanalization. The advantage of surgical embryotomy is not only to decanalize occluded vessel, but also to repair the injured vessels during endovascular procedure in very short time. Endovascular and the surgery are not the versus. Uh, we can collaborate. It, uh, we can compensate. So uh, this is uh, what I want to emphasize uh, in this topic. That's all, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, finally, I, I would like to announce about the uh, uh, Far East Neurosurgery Supplied Microsurgery course. This year it's uh, uh, canceled, uh, but the next year uh, we can, I hope, uh, we can have this uh, live course. Uh, next year, July 18 to 23. Uh, as usual, uh, you, as usual uh, we have a bypass hands-on course in the morning on Sunday, educational lectures in the afternoon. And from Monday to Friday, we have a live surgery, at least two to three cases. Uh, if you have an interest, please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vieira. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Tanikawa, for your brilliant presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we all learned a lot tonight. And I would now like to open for questions from the panelists. Uh, let's start. Professor Yudu, you want to say something or ask something? Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Nikawa. Uh, it was a, a very impressive and teaching uh, lecture. Congratulations for your expertise. And again, it brings me the issue that I did mention yesterday that the young neurosurgeons 
uh, they need to go to the lab uh, if they want to remain mm -hmm. the, the neurovascular surgery they did they need to be expert on uh, all types of uh, EC, IC, uh, and uh, internal uh, IC anatomies. My question to you uh, goes to the, your first uh, your first slides actually. Uh, when you talk about stamp pressure, uh, when you mm -hmm. do a, 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 do you think that measuring the stamp pressure are you abolishing the the BTO test? So you just rely on the pressure or you carry on doing the traditional BTO test, occlusion, de decreasing the blood pressure, or just the measuring the pressure is enough for you to decide whether or not that patient would support or not the ligation of the, of the parent vessel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, in our institute, uh, we, just, we do just measure the stamp pressure only. Uh, I uh, we never we never perform the uh, pressure decreasing during balloon test occlusion. The the reason why is uh, because uh, the patient who needs the balloon test occlusion always have the uh, complex large giant carotid aneurysm, and uh, many complications that has already been reported uh, in, during a balloon test occlusion or a long time around the 20 minutes, 30 minutes with uh, blood pressure decline, de declining. Because, of, because the many of the complication uh, is due to a uh, uh, thrombus formation inside aneurysm during uh, mm -hmm. bone test occlusion. Even after, even with the uh, he systemic heparinization, by balloon occlusion test, the thrombus formation inside the annuals always happen. Uh, this is a big problem. The, because, uh, you know, the, the balloon test occlusion is just an just a exam before, before treatment, not a treatment, but uh, with, with a, such an uh, invasive examination, I, I uh, in my opinion, I should, we should avoid uh, such a complication. So that, this is the biggest reason why I don't uh, decrease the blood pressure during uh, blood test occlusion. And uh, just uh, measuring MC pressure, as I mentioned, if uh, uh, stamp pressure was uh, uh, more than 0 0.8, 80%, more than 80%. The no, no revascularization is necessary. Just a simple occlusion of the internal cartilage works well. So uh, just, a, just a measuring stamp pressure in order to know the total collateral power through the ACOM and the PCOM and the uh, left meningeal power from a PCA. Oh, thank you. Enough. That's a very useful information that not only saves time, but also saves some, some complications as you did mention. Perhaps my uh, our endovascular colleagues in the audience, Dr. Gustavo would like to, to go into this BTO issue. Dr. Gustavo Pivok is there. I hope he is. If he's not, uh, I think Dr. Eduardo Ernesto is in the audience. He could also comment on that. Eduardo Ernesto, are you there? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I'm very surprised. I think first, thank you for a very nice presentation. I'm very impressed. It's, uh, thank you. I am uh, especially surprised by this case uh, uh, with uh, uh, perforation during uh, uh, trabectomy in the vascular. Mm -hmm. And normally we see uh, when we have a perforation uh, in few minutes, uh, you, the, the bleed stops. Uh, I never see uh, 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 bleeding that continues for a, lot, uh, uh, a long time. And uh, I'm surprised if you have time to 
operate the patient and uh, during uh, six, 60 minutes is too long time. Uh, normally, uh, you can expect the patient is this, uh, is dead. Uh, I'm surprised. Uh, uh, normally, when you have a complication, this kind of complication, uh, when we make a control, in three, four minutes after, uh, the bleeding stops. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's often, uh, do you have this, uh, you can uh, operate in a, in a acute uh, uh, bleeding for, uh, for, for perforation? Uh, actually, uh, the, that perforation I showed you, that, just uh, one case, that case only. Uh, and uh, another uh, breathing complication was a uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, small, small branch, uh, small branch uh, pulling injury due to a uh, uh, due to thrombectomy by uh, by uh, by using a treble or something. By by pulling the M1 segment, the small branch was abrupted, and the breathing happened. Uh, there are two two cases, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's a rarely uh, rarely happen. But uh, in that case of a perforation, the breathing was very strong. So the with the conservative treatment, the patient uh, may be there. So we, we did the surgery immediately. Okay, and uh, just another uh, point. Uh, for the test, uh, occlusion test with balloon, mm -hmm. uh, we perform before the surgery or mm -hmm. during the surgery in the same time, in the same uh, uh, intervention, the, the test of occlusion. test of occlusion before surgery. Before surgery. Before surgery, of course. And uh, during surgery, uh, we can measure the MC pressure through STMC bypass. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jean, do you want to ask something or, or say something about the presentation? Thank you. Hi, Dr. Tekawa. It's a great pleasure to be with you again. We have been together two months ago in Phoenix during his Hi. course along with Dr. Lotta. So I had the great, uh, such a great privilege to, to see personally his technique. It's amazing technique. And also the beauty of the case that he just presented to us tonight. Thank you for sharing your great experience with us. Personally, Welcome. personally, I don't have uh, experience with ischemic case, just the cases you present to us. At, at the end, you, you show you show us the flow chart that you you use. First, you use RTPA, and if mm -hmm. it doesn't work, you go to uh, uh, embolism uh, endovascular thrombectomy, and if it doesn't work, you go to the surgery. Yeah. But the case that you go for the surgery, you already use it, uh, RTPA. You already use some uh, uh, drugs yeah. uh, during the endovascular, so you go. When you go to the surgery, you, you go for a such difficult and dangerous situation with the risk <laughs> of some yeah. hemorrhage. How how you do you deal with this situation? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a good question and uh, it's uh, the frequent question about the uh, TPA uh, surgery after TPA. Uh, nothing happened. Not a dangerous because. Uh, many of the neurosurgeons are so afraid of a TPA or urokinase, but uh, even after using such a, a drug agent, uh, just uh, one hour later, two hours later, nothing happened because the TPA, the half time is uh, two, three minutes. No problem. Even urokinase, uh, it's, a, it's a longer than TPA. But uh, in my experience, after using urokinase more than uh, 
uh, more than uh, 200,000 200, or 300,000 unit, international unit of euro kindness. And uh, one or two hours later, I have many experience of craniotomy and embolectomy. Uh, I, I, I don't have any trouble with a uh, hemostasis. So the, the using a TPA is, uh, does not matter. No problem. TP, TPA is no problem, but the anticoagulation during the endovascular. You, you use some anticoagulation to perform uh, the endovascular the procedure. Yes. Heparin. And then after yeah. that, you take the patient for surgery. Yeah. Yeah, even after heparin, uh, the coagulation time is prolonged, but uh, we can reverse it. We can reverse it easily use, uh, using protamine. Mm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, no problem. Professor, well, thank in, you very much. In remote areas which you even don't have TPA, or can you go direct to the thrombectomy? Do you think that? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, if uh, th there, there were no chance to use a TPA, directly you can go to an uh, embolectomy. And uh, if you, you don't have an uh, endovascular surgeon, endovascular colleagues, that if you wish to save the patient, you can choose an uh, open surgery. Because of the opening of cerebral fissure, uh, exposing an M1 segment, M2 segment, ICA, it's uh, easy for you. Yeah, but do you feel uh, worried about some scientific support for that, you know? Mm -hmm. scientific support articles and so on yeah the about the uh, about the surgical embryotomy no scientific support no evidence no evidence such as endovascular treatment because uh, uh, nowadays the uh, endovascular treatment uh, has uh, evidence of the uh, uh, endovascular recognition. And uh, nowadays, uh, we, ha we have, an, we, we, uh, we are not necessary of the evidence of surgery. Almost cases can be treated by uh, endovascular uh, in my institute as well. So the main surgical, main role of a surgery uh, after in uh, acute stroke, especially after endovascular treatment, is the is a, a treatment of a complication, especially hemorrhagic complication, or uh, dissection something, dissecting uh, dissection and and uh, dissecting occlusion of the uh, parent artery something. Professor Johimura, what do you think about these thrombectomies here in Latin America? What do you think about it in, the, in Latin America? Thrombectomy. Can you listen to me now? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I made my first embolectomy in 2013, in, uh, before the, the, the Nashville Hope like uh, Rokuya, and uh, yeah. we talked about this several times. I think that uh, it's very interesting because uh, it's, the thrombectomy is not so difficult, technically. Uh, even uh, if you cannot make the stitches, uh, there are some clips that you can use. For example, Peter Lassi have the tunnel clip that you can open the artery and you can close with a clip if you cannot do a, a suture. Okay, but I think that the the problem that we have now is the neurologists are uh, associated with the endovascular. The neurosurgeon is not in the discussion of the ischemia, the good ischemia. The neurosurgeon came uh, after 12 to 24 hours to do the decompressive craniectomy. That's the only thing that we do as neurosurgeons. Okay, but we must know that the endovascular therapy is not available everywhere. And that is very important. In Latin America, we must realize 
that in some places we lost patients because we don't have endovascular. We must think about this because uh, we, we, need, we take time to have endovascular in everywhere. It's easy for me because I am in an institute. I have five endovascular, you know, and then we have 24 hours a day, seven days a, day, a week, we have endovascular for thrombectomy, okay? But always we have patients that can, you can do something for them. I made a thrombectomy two days ago, two days ago, in a, in a, in a woman of 40 years, because she have a, a occlusion of the carotid artery and the patient have only a small core infarction, but have more 24 hours. And then that's a problem of, of label. We are, we, the neurosurgeons today are, are so afraid of off-label. But for, for example, the endovascular, they, they do off-label things all the time and they are not afraid. They put, for example, flow diverter in M2, in anterior cerebral artery, everywhere. And that is off-label because the FDA only approved to the PCOM, you see? But they are not afraid. The same thing happened in 2000, 2013 when the, the New England Journal of Medicine said that the thrombectomy was the same that the, that the TPA, but they not stop. They continue doing the procedure. And in 2015, they made the Nashville thing, the Nashville hope with five studies to demonstrate the endovascular as, as the gold standard. I think that we, the surgeons, must be inside the stroke the thing we must do is be in the discussion of the patients with the, the neurologist and the endovascular. After that, the patients will come. Maybe not today, but if you think about this, the endovascular have success in 90% of the cases. In 90% of the cases, you can open the artery, you see? But in 10%, they cannot open. And the, the patient stop the treatment and we wait for the decompressive craniectomy, but we can get inside that, that kind of patient and do the thrombectomy and be collabor collaborative with the endovascular people. That's the thing that I, I, I try to think about this. We in Chile made the first uh, neurosurgical symposium of management of ischemia in 2012. Very controversial. The neurologists was, were mad in that time because they think this is crazy to open the head to take out a clot. But if you see the result of Rokuya, the results are the same. But Rokuya is very serious and he stopped to do the microsurgery in 2015 because the evidence is said that the endovascular is, is the gold standard. I'm not saying that we, we have to operate the patient, but if endovascular is not available, we must do something for the patient. We must not wait for the decompressive craniectomy. I think that the stroke is, is a good field for the future for a microsurgery. Because when the neurosurgeons, you ask for a 100 neurosurgeons, you said, why do you think about revascularization in a stroke? All the neurosurgeons think that we are talking about bypass. But we are not talking about bypass. We are talking about thrombectomy and bypass. I, I'm sure that most of the, sur the surgeons here that never uh, heard uh, Rokuya before, they never realize that it's possible to take out the clot. And to take out the clot is not so difficult. But I think we must be very serious with the data. And then we, we, the first thing is go into the discussion and after that, wait for the patient. But for that, we need to train and we need to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Binshu, want to add something in this panel? your opinion about? Hello, Lukoya. Nice presentation. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, uh, you did a great job, uh, especially in the treat the acute uh, thromboectomy. Uh, so my question is: uh, Most of uh, your uh, your cases uh, should the that's the thrombos. So this kind of thrombos actually it's also fit uh, by uh, endovascular treatment. So do you have some uh, cases that uh, 
uh, there's some uh, local stenosis, uh, chronic stenosis with plaques at the local side of the MCA bifurcation like this. Yeah. So it's uh, it's hard to treat. Yes. Or, yes. Uh, do you have some cases after failed yeah. uh, endovascular treatment to transfer to your? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Of course, I have. And uh, the last case I showed you uh, with the STMC bypass. That case I had uh, the uh, cardiogenic thrombosis, thr thr embolism, and uh, uh, atherosclerotic change uh, with the plaque at the M1 segment. Mm -hmm. And the simultaneously, uh, M2 segment has a very strong atherosclerotic change. That's the reason why, even after the, the thrombectomy, the intimal injury was very strong chronically. Uh, so uh, even after reflow, the, the vessel could not be recognized, easily occluded uh, rapidly. So, uh, but uh, this condition, where the, the patient have the, uh, the cardiogenic embolism with uh, uh, atherosclerotic change or not, uh, it can be, it can be understood after opening head. In uh, endovascular treatment uh, or t just a TP administration, we cannot know because we can't see the lesion directly. During endovascular recognition trial, uh, by the feeling of uh, the guiding wire or the microcassitus feeling, that we can indirectly uh, uh, diagnose, oh, there may be have the plaque or something uh, very strong stenosis. That's it. But uh, uh, in a surgery, during the surgery, we can see directly the vessel and uh, we can confirm, oh, there is a very strong yellow plaque and uh, here, here must be stenosis. So even after thrombectomy, here must be easily occluded. So we need a STMC bypass additionally. During the surgery, immediately we can understand, decide the, the next, next way. This is a very important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many percentages of this kind of patient in your theory? Uh, 10%. 10%, okay. Yeah, around 10% in my, in my experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe maybe le less than 10%. So do you always prepare, uh, save the STA before you, uh, the creotomy to- No, uh, case, no, no. Case, no? Mm -hmm. For embryotomy, the STA mm -hmm. is included in the skin flap, not mm -hmm. to injure the STA trunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Is, uh, this, this is uh, our routine work for mm -hmm. uh, front craniotomy. So in case- uh, Just to... open, simply open and simply open the fissure and expose uh, the occluded vessel mm -hmm. and the thrombic first. Okay. Yeah. It's Professor Chanikawa, beautiful. Uh, want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor Hukuya. Nice to see you again. Thank you for having hey. How are you doing? I, I have uh, a question for you. Yeah. Just, just a moment, just a moment, one minute. Oops. <laughs> oh, uh -oh. So, so we, we see that uh, for a stroke, there is always a, a field for us to get in and be more aggressive. You know that uh, the compressive craniectomy is uh, more violent than a simple thrombectomy. And do you think, Mura, that it can avoid uh, the compressive craniectomy, uh, postoperative? Yes. It's very, it's very, it's very interesting. I think we we must have some uh, approach to this problem. And then what what I did, the first patients that I did, all the patients I did the compressive craniectomy. You see, because it's accepted. Then you go to the, the compressive craniectomy. You know that this is a mismatch and you do the thrombectomy. And the patient recover the, the penumbra. And then what you do after two or three years, you can, you can convince 
the people, you know, the neurologist. You do both. Know. So do the, the, the compressive and go there and do the arteriotomy. Uh, we're not going to do some damage to the patient because it's lost. They said, you say, okay, we can do a very, very early decompressive canectomy and you, you take a look. And, and after that, you can show to them that the, the, the brain not swelling and the, 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 you don't need to, the, the decompressive canectomy. And after that, you, after one or two years, this is a process. They say, okay, Marcos, you, you can go to the thrombectomy and not, not, not take out the bone, you see? But mm -hmm. you, you cannot go now in 2020 and do a thrombectomy without nothing else because it's, it's, that is not accepted. You know what I mean? It's very important. It's very, very important to have some approach to the problem. The first thing is go to, into the discussion. You must go with the neurologist. Please invite me when you have a stroke and we can discuss. No, no, don't call me uh, tomorrow when the patient is lost. You see, that's the, the, the first step. We, when mm -hmm. we get that, we can discuss about bypass or thrombectomy, whatever you want. But the first thing is be involved in the discussion. That's the only thing. Well, very nice point, Professor George Mura, because this was one of my questions. Uh, I will ask again for Professor Tanikawa if he always goes to this thrombectomy, arteriotomy, uh, and he leaves a craniectomy or he doesn't leave. Uh, Professor George just told uh, uh, about his experience now for us. And my other question is about uh, what you think of the perspectives of the future of the bypass surgery and microsurgery for these large and big aneurysms uh, at the paracrinoid region with the advent of these new flow diverters, second generation, third generation, 10th generation, that they keep reporting that they have better outcomes with less invasive techniques. Do you think it, it will be the future or we will continue doing that? Because it, it's very difficult, it's very technical. Uh, we need uh, to achieve uh, great skills to do this, what you do, okay? To deal with this kind of lesions. Yeah, good question. Uh, I think, uh... From now, the endovascular treatment, especially a flow diverter, will be the, 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 indi in the indication to use a flow diverter uh, will be uh, extended much more. Uh, not only a paracrine or a PCOM aneurysms, but also uh, 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 ex it will be extended to a MCA, uh, ACA, something. Absolutely. Uh, with uh, the developing uh, the, the good stenting devices. But even after the developing such devices, uh, we must have the uh, uh, complication or uh, recurrence uh, of a bad, bad result of uh, the endovascular treatment. As I showed you in my presentation, even after very intensive, uh, very strong uh, packed coiling aneurysm, and aneurysm has still recurrence, and uh, not only recurrence, uh, but also uh, the other new neurological deficit like ultramotor uh, palsy like that, and the uh, patient suffered from so much. And uh, even such uh, the, the complex cases, uh, patient strongly wish to be uh, treated. And uh, after, after such a, a failure of endovascular treatment, always uh, many of the endovascular surgeons say to the patient, uh, we have no way to treat you, so you should not come. You, you don't need to come to, to our clinic, to his clinic, go to other surgeons clinic. And then the many of such a patient transferred to my clinic, to my hospital. So the neurosurgeon must respond 
uh, to so to such a patient. And uh, uh, in such situation, as I showed you, um, revascularization procedure is necessary. Without bypass, uh, we can't treat such a, a complex cases. If if the the coiling so much inside the aneurysm, stenting inside the parent artery. Absolutely, uh, we need something revascularization distal to the lesion. So, uh, with a developing flow diverter, the absolutely high flow bypass for cavernous segment giant aneurysm uh, will, will be decreased so much. Not necessary. But some of them have the recurrence, has a bleeding, has a stent occlusion, something. After something happened, surgeon must help the patient. So to save the patient, neurosurgeon have to know the way to save the patient. The way of the save the patient is by <coughs> Clipping is, is impossible for such a complex aneurysm. I showed you the coiled picum aneurysm. It's uh, impossible to put the clip on the neck. So the end of us, uh, the, the bypass procedure uh, must be developed so much from now on by young neurosurgeons trained continue train, you guys must train, especially not a, not a high flow bypass, especially low flow bypass, small bypass, using STA graft, using occipital artery to, uh, uh, to uh, distal cerebral arteries like uh, M2, M3, M4 segment, A2, A3, A4 segment, P2, P3, P4 segment. Small, small artery revascularization uh, is uh, very worth, very worthy in uh, neurosurgery complex lesions. Claudio, Vidal wants to add something in your opinion because we're at the end of the talk. Claudio Vidal wants to say something. Yes, uh, I really appreciate your lecture. I have the, op I had the opportunity to see you in the surgical field about five years ago in Helsinki and it's your technique is really amazing. I usually say to my residents that you are one of, one of the guys that I, I see during the surgery that is more impressive. And, uh, but in a, from a good point of, of view, I'm really uh, discomfort with the second part of your class uh, about the surgical treatment of uh, ischemic lesions. And uh, I think that was very good because I, I'm now uh, with the sensation that I have to change my mind and I have to rethink uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, therapeutic uh, options that we have. So thank you, and I will have to study more about. I, I I think that a new chapter in ischemic disease may be writing now by you and uh, your team. Thank you. Okay. Eduardo Thank wants you. to end the questions and then we're gonna to the close remarks. Okay, Eduardo, please. Yes, uh, I have two two questions. The first first one is about uh, uh, how do you manage the the anti placatory medications pre and post bypass. Mm -hmm. And the second one is about training. Uh, what's the, the, the best uh, simulation you can do? Uh, which way is the best 
to train, especially for those deep bypasses for SCA, for PCA, uh, not so much the, the superficial ones, but especially the those deep bypasses. Uh, which way do you think is better to to train? Yeah. Uh, first question, uh, anti proteic agent uh, usage. Uh, basically, the patient who need a bypass always have the arteriosclerotic change. Uh, many, of, many of them always have the diabetes mellitus. And uh, you know, the everyone know diabetes mellitus ac accelerate the arteriosclerotic change and uh, it causes a chronic intimal injury. So, these patients always have the uh, easy thrombosis of the uh, uh, microanosmosis. To, to prevent it, we need uh, antiprotrate, at least aspirin. I usually use 100 milligram aspirin before surgery five to seven days ago, regardless uh, unruptured complex aneurysm or a chronic ischemic patient. And the second question, ah, and after surgery, uh, basically I use uh, aspirin uh, continuously uh, forever. Uh, and the second question, the training, especially deep bypass. Yes, deep bypass is, uh, is uh, difficult. Uh, you, you need uh, off the job training. Uh, using a synthetic tube. Synthetic tube is good enough. And uh, we can use uh, something like a tissue box and uh, we can sim uh, the simulate the deep operative field through the, the opening of a tissue box. <laughs> and uh, uh, we can uh, train. But uh, just uh, we need a, such, a, such a training of a deep bypass but additionally, much more important thing, as I emphasized in the, in the uh, first segment of my presentation, the, the training of approach, especially uh, the dissection of the cerebrum fissure, preserving everything, uh, separating cerebrum fissure from distally to proximal. The distal cerebrum fissure in a superficial, but uh, by separating the frontal temporal lobe, uh, you can enter the insular system. In, in the insular system, to, to, to reach the insular surface, there is a two, 23, 30 millimeters from the surface of the brain. And uh, it, it is, there is a distance around the, uh, 10 millimeter more from the bony surface. And uh, if you go, much more proximally to all the uh, M1 segment or carotid from the, the brain surface, it, uh, the distance may be uh, 50 millimeter, 70 millimeter, uh, depends on the patient has the size, the 10 at 100 millimeter. So by separating cerebral and fissure very precisely uh, with preserving veins and uh, with the highest magnetization uh, with this dissecting procedure uh, process, uh, we can uh, we can train our uh, collaboration of by both hands, fingers, arms, and uh, this is a very good training to control your finger in a very deep narrow area. So all the manipulation in neurosurgery, including distal cerebrum fissure dissection, trans proximal cerebrum dissection, the hemostatic uh, procedure manipulation, uh, neck clipping to the uh, aneurysm. But uh, with the highest magnification and the microscope, these are the very, very effective training. So you need a, the both both two two way training, off the job microanastomosis training, shallow shallow anastomosis, deep anastomosis, and on the other hand, the actual daily work using a, a microscope 
dissecting fissure and uh, uh, stitching uh, the dura under microscope completely meticulously. All the, all the such a procedure is a uh, training for uh, difficult bypass. This is my opinion. Thank you. Professor. Okay, we want to close because it's too late here. It's almost midnight. And Igor, please uh, say the closing remarks. And Professor, we hope to have you all together with Binshu maybe next year with us in May during yeah. our tour here around big cities here. Thank you. Yeah, one year. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Igor. Enjoy, enjoy wow. the Sunday morning, Dr. Yeah. <laughs> well, on behalf of our society, I'd like to thank Dr. Tanikawa for his kindness. He is so humble and an amazing experience and an outstanding lecture. Hope to see you very soon, Professor. Only two words for you. Arigato, Sensei. Thank Arigato. you very much. And thank, thank you to all the panelists. Thanks, Eduardo. Thanks, Marcos. Thanks all of you. I hope to see you soon in our next round of webinars. And it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. Have a nice weekend and keep safe. Our prayers and thoughts to all our colleagues, doctors and your surgeons fighting COVID in the trenches around the world. Thank you very much for your presence here. See you.